have a video now. This is our Mission Sunday, and we have a guest speaker. And why it's just so apropos is our guest speaker is Josh Dunn, their son, who is at Sacatecas Bible Church. And we've partnered a little bit with them, especially during the pandemic. There were some major needs that we were able to respond to. People were out of work. Uh, food and supplies were short, and it just worked out perfectly where our church could respond and I want you to get to see how God is building his church everywhere. And he's doing this in, in, in uh, this particular ministry in Mexico. And it's super exciting. And I just can't wait for Josh to preach. He has as much time as he needs. But we're going to watch a video. Me media team, are we ready? Yes. Let's watch this video and get a taste of his ministry. And then, Josh, you just come up and preach the word.
Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you here this morning. Uh, that was just a small glimpse of this past year uh, in, in Zacatecas. Um, as Chago mentioned, and I want to, let me connect this here. As Chago mentioned, um, I want to start out and just thank you all uh, for partnering um, with us in the ministry down there in the gospel work in Zacatecas. Uh, as he mentioned, last year uh, you guys sent an offering around December time, uh, some funds down to help us with our food box uh, ministry that we have down there, and it was a huge blessing because uh, this last year, year and a half, has been super difficult uh, for many of the believers in our church and in our community as well. Uh, and as you saw in the video there too, uh, some of that food box ministry stuff that we were putting together there, uh, that was uh, what you guys participated in. We were able to provide for two full months uh, food boxes for the families that were in need. And actually over the last year and a half, uh, God has continue, continued to bless uh, that ministry and, and, and that opportunity and so we've been able to for the last year and a half consistently provide food boxes uh, and, and meals uh, for families that, that are in need. Uh, every two to three weeks we continue distribu distributing those and these are not just like a bag of uh, a few vegetables and fruits and some other stuff. We're giving away like 25 pounds of, of fruits and vegetables to each family along with three to four five pounds of, of fresh meat and then eggs and rice and beans and milk and so the family's getting uh, literally a week to more worth of, of food and and so the Lord's really been been supplying their um, so we just give a huge thank you to you and all of the brothers and sisters down there wanted to extend um, their thankfulness to you and to greet you all in the name of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they were so excited that I was going to be here uh, with you. And um, in the church there right now, just a brief introduction of, of the church. Uh, currently there's three, there are three men uh, participating uh, in, as elders uh, in the ministry and we have additionally added another three men right now that we are, have uh, brought on as uh, teachers and, and, and uh, that are preaching, that we're training, uh, looking for the Lord to, to develop uh, and asking God to grow them into elder qualified men. So there's six of, six of us men right now that are participating in the preaching and teaching and our whole purpose down there is disciple making and training leaders to multiply churches. And so we're in that process right now of looking to, to multiply the church plant that we have in Zacatecas. And we're just praying that the Lord will, will develop these men into, into godly leaders and that we'll be able to do that to be able to plant a, another, another church. We have two works as well. One in a little town uh, of Ojo Caliente, which is about 40 minutes from Zacatecas, that we go to on a, a, every two weeks. Uh, we go and visit them and share the word. And then the week that we don't go, they come. A few of the families come. There's four or five families there. So we're ministering there as well. And then we've been doing that for about a year now. And there's another community uh, in Rio Verde, which is in San Luis Potosí, which is about four hours from where we are. Uh, and we go there, uh, try to go there every month. We don't usually make it every month, because especially in the last year. But we've been there for about two and a half years. We have another four families there that are meeting together and, and we're actually doing discipleships through uh, internet, through Skype, uh, not Skype, through Zoom and some other things um, to be able to help develop a couple men that are there that are uh, teaching and doing things like that. And so we're just praying that the Lord will continue to uh, establish his kingdom in, in all places. We're not just working there in Zacatecas, but we're trying to uh, plant churches that reproduce uh, other churches and so that's our goal we've been down there for we're almost about to complete 10 years uh, in Zacatecas uh, this coming April will be 10 years there and so uh, this church uh, it, Zacatecas Bible Church uh, will be we're just now completing about we're just now completing seven years this year as a church body which started with two to three families in a house uh, meeting and, and currently there's uh, over 100 people meeting uh, on a weekly basis including their kids and families and things like that so uh, the Lord has just really blessed us and especially in this last year um, that's probably enough of an introduction to the church in Zacatecas uh, I know I could share a lot of different things with you guys but 
I really am here with a purpose to share the Word of God, and I'm so thankful for that opportunity. You can open your Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 22, uh, and I just would ask you to continue to pray for us as we seek to fulfill the purposes of God uh, in Zacatecas and around Mexico uh, and around the world. That's really the purpose of, of and the mission of the church. Um, that's what I want to share with you today, uh, fulfilling the purposes of God in the world. And if I seem a little bit distracted, possibly, uh, Chagra didn't mention it, but Friday we just welcomed a new baby into our house, uh, Theophilus Daniel. Uh, he came to us on Friday morning. He was born Thursday night, and he came into our home on, on Friday uh, through adoption. And you can see his big brother, Zach, uh, Zachariah, there next to him, Zachariah James. is super happy to have uh, his brother. And so he came into our home at 1, and he was born Thursday night. And then at 5 o'clock, I had to leave and go to a men's conference in a town about an hour away and I got home about 11 o'clock at night and I packed really quick and seven, 7 in the morning yesterday we left Zacatecas and drove up here and I got to see Pastor Nelson um, so we stopped uh, there and to see him and he sends his greetings to you all as well he's doing doing awesome and building a house and all that kind of stuff so it's really cool you can kind of see it in the background there um, Nelson was my first tutor in language school 10 11 years ago when I came to RGBI uh, and so we've been really close to them uh, throughout this whole entire time and just a, a dear brother and I, I love him and his family and so um, it's been a super busy couple of days but we're going to trust in God that he is going to help us understand uh, his word this morning. I'd like to open in, in prayer if we could do that so let's bow our heads and, and pray. Lord God we are so grateful for your word. We're thankful for your church for your body we're thankful for your holy spirit and we ask that you would bring those three things together this morning your spirit your word and your people and you'd help me to communicate uh, the message that you have for your people this morning and we pray this in christ's name amen so fulfilling the purposes of god in the world who here has the desire to fulfill god's purpose in the world in your life. I pray that all of us have that desire. I pray that we're here for that reason. I pray that we have that desire uh, each day of our life. And God has purposes and his will that he has that are so much bigger than even what we can think and ask or imagine. God's already given us his will for us. The majority of his will is already given to us right here. I would submit 99%. It's not a statistic that's legit. Some people say 95%. The revealed word, the revealed will of God in his word, we already have it. It's contained in scriptures. 99%, I would say, of his will for us is revealed in this book. And the vast majority of our life is lived in that 99% of God's revealed will. So what do we have to do? We have to know this, right? This is what we have to know. We don't have to be looking for something outside of his word or looking for some extra biblical revelation. He's already given it to us right here. It's his decreed and revealed will. And that's why it's so important to read and to study and to meditate on God's word every single day. The word of God says that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And as believers, we are called to join our lives with God's purposes and his plans. So when we're willing to obey God's 99% of his revealed will, then and only then will he reveal that other 1% that's maybe more specific to each of us to each individual to each family and what I mean by that is that when we live every single day fulfilling God's purposes for us through the word of God and that revealed will is the same for everyone that 99% is the same for everyone when we live that out in our life 
then we will be able to live out that specific will that he has on each of our lives. And so as a brief introduction, I want to look at a few passages. You don't need to turn there. We're going to be in Matthew 22, uh, verse uh, 36 through 40 is where we're going to be. But I'm just going to put on the screen here a few places where God shows what his will is for us. It's the same for everyone, okay? Live spirit-filled. God's will for you is to live a spirit-filled life, to be filled with the spirit, to be controlled by the spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. God's will for you is to be holy, sanctified, and set apart, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, to live a holy life. God's will for you is to be joyful and thankful in all situations, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. God's will is to transform your mind, that by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that is God's will for you. God's will for you, according to Hebrews 10, 25, is to live in community with others. And God's will in Ephesians 5, 8 through 10 is to live and walk in the light of Christ. So those are some places where when it says this is God's will for you, like we need to like pay attention. We need to open our minds and our eyes and go, okay, we can't be sitting there going, oh God, I just really want you to tell me what you want me to do. And if you're not living these things out, God, ain't, God is not going to speak to you in other areas, in other ways, if you're not obeying in these areas that he's already declared to you. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may obey all the words of this law. God has revealed so much of his will to us. His purposes for us and for the world are not hidden. He has hidden some things, but his purposes for us are not hidden. They are given to us so that we might walk in his will, like it says here, and obey all the words in obedience to the word that is already revealed. Today we're going to focus just on one passage, and that's Matthew 22, 36 through 40, and it says this. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And although this lawyer here postures this question to try to trap Jesus, which he thinks he's going to be really smart and trap Jesus into uh, into the, in, with this question, like many times the Pharisees came up and, and tried to do with him, Jesus answers the question that is posed, but in essence he explains something totally different as well. Um, he, in essence, is telling us what does it mean to be a Christian. He responds by saying and telling us what is a true disciple. This is the most basic question for all of our Christian life, for every person and every believer and follower of Christ, Christ, life boils down to the response that Jesus gives here. And what does, he, what does he say? He says, love God and love people. That's what it boils down to. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in the most basic sense. And that's what we're going to develop here a little bit more this morning. Um, this is what it looks like to fulfill the purposes of God in the world. This is the great commandment that Jesus says. There's an author and a, a speaker who I uh, thoroughly enjoy, uh, Israel Wayne. It, he's not super well known, but he, uh, I highly recommend him for anything relating to Christian worldview and parenting. And if you ever want to have uh, somebody come and speak or do a conference or something like that, he is excellent. Um, he says, based off of this passage, he developed a family purpose statement, and he says, we exist to know love and serve God and to love and serve others um, based off of these verses in Matthew 22. True followers of Christ love God and love others. True disciples of Jesus serve God and serve others. Um, and our family adopted this mission statement quite a while back, uh, but we added one word to it. We say, we exist to know, love, and serve God and to know, love, and serve others. Know, love, and serve God. Know, love, and serve others. This is how you fulfill the purposes of God in the world. This one sentence 
dictates my whole life. This one declaration has dictated my family's life for at least now for the last 12 to 15 years. This statement right here. Everything that we do on a daily basis is vetted through the lens of this mission statement right here. Everything that we are and everything that we do has to do with this purpose and this mission statement. About 15 years ago, God did something incredible in, in the life of my, my wife, Heather, and I. And since that point, we have been striving in the strength and power of God daily to live out this mission statement in our family. Um, anybody who, I know you guys don't know us from 15 years ago, but anybody who, who does know us from 15 years ago to today uh, understands that something happened. Something happened. Um, and when my dad preached a few weeks ago, and he said that something happened in his life as well, and it was he started to take serious the word of God, right? Um, and that change that he applied to his life was drastic, and that's what happened in our life as well. We decided to start taking seriously the scripture, and when we adopted this as our family mission statement, our family purpose statement that's based off of scripture, I believe apart from bringing glory to Christ, which is our ultimate goal and our ultimate purpose, this uh, is the greatest purpose for every Christian. And I think when we complete and fulfill this, we also are bringing glory to Christ. All glory to Christ we just uh, sang. And if you have a mission statement for your family, that's a great thing. If you don't, I highly recommend you adopt one. I highly recommend you write one. I highly re recommend you get one. Um, because why? If you don't have and are not living by a mission or a purpose statement, then how do you know if you're fulfilling the purposes of God for your life? How do you know if your decisions are in accordance to the will of God and his plan for you? What does it really mean to know, love, and serve God, know, love, and serve people? I'm gonna take for granted here this morning that all of us that are here, and I know I'm probably making a, a mistake by doing this, but I'm gonna take for granted that all of us who are here have a desire to know, love, and serve God. That's why we're here. I, I'm taking that for granted, and I know I could be mistaken because I know that within every church, that's not necessarily true, but we don't have time to develop that side of it. We don't have time to develop that side of knowing, loving, and serving God, so what I'm gonna focus on is knowing, loving, and serving people, taking for granted that your desire of your heart is already to know, love, and, and serve God. Um, I believe that Christ here is telling us that our vertical relationship with God, so we have a vertical relationship with God, with Christ, that that vertical relationship with God is manifested through our horizontal relationships with others. In our knowing, loving, and serving others. That's how we manifest whether or not we truly love and serve God. Um, so we're going to focus a little bit more on connecting uh, that aspect of our fulfilling God's purposes for us in relation to the world. Uh, and I want to do something a little bit different this morning to, to introduce this uh, because uh, I think it'll help us understand uh, a little bit better. But... And this is not uh, original to me. Uh, one of the missionaries that we support, uh, Zacatecas Bible Church supports, that's in the uh, remote area in, in the mountains of Chihuahua, reaching unreached people groups there, came and presented to our church, and he shared a couple of these uh, bullet point slides that I want to share with you just to, to help us set the, set the table for what we're going to look at. Um, imagine that the world was reduced to a community of 100 people, right? So there's about 8 billion people in the world. And each person here on the screen represents uh, 80 million people. So uh, there's 100 people right here. So we're going to pretend that this is the community that you live in. You live in this community of 100 people, right? Um, and this is the representation of the whole entire world. So you are one of these 100. If you can see in the very middle there, there's a little green guy in the center. That's, that's you. So think about that in your mind. Um, who would your neighbors be in this community of 100? Who would those uh, others be that you are called to get to know, called to love, and called to serve? Uh, let's look at, break this down in ages. Uh, 10 of those people are less than five years old. 
Uh, 36 of them are under 20 years old, so 20 down uh, to, to recently born. 36% of the world's population is, is under 20 years old. 69% of the world's population is under 40 years old. Uh, and 90% are less than 60 year, years old. That means that only 10 uh, people in your community of 100 are over 60 years old. Uh, is there uh, somebody here that's over 80? Because only one, percent, only one person in those 100 is over 80. So I'm not sure there's anybody over 80 here, but if you are, you're in like that elite, elite status of the world where, where not many people get to, to that age. And we're talking in, at a global scale, but in your community, reduced down, um, the majority, 90% of those people are under 60 years of age, okay? Um, what nationalities would be your neighbors in this community? Uh, 20 of them would be Chinese, 18 would be from India, 22 would be from the rest of Asia. That's 60 out of 100 of our neighbors are Asians, of those people that God has called us to love and serve are, are Asians, okay? Um, 15 from Africa, 12 from Europe, including Russia, 8 from Central and South America, and look at the big whopping universe that we live in, and we represent 5% of the population in the world. And this is not just the United States we're talking about, this is including Mexico and Canada. So your little world that you live in here, our little world that we represent here, this 5%, um, that we wrap ourselves up in all the time is really nothing. It's a nothing burger uh, compared to the world, right? So we need to start getting that mindset and thinking that it's not about us. This universe isn't, doesn't revolve around, the world doesn't even revolve around us, right? So we don't exist um, to build our little kingdoms here. We exist and we have a purpose and it is to know, love, and serve God and know, love, and serve others. And many, if not the vast majority, in the Christian community today, and I'm gonna spe specifically speak about the Western Christian community, the American church, many are living to love and serve themselves, not to love and serve others. Many are building their own little kingdom on their own little uh, area thinking about no one but themselves, and that's including the majority of people that are in the church today. They are fulfilling all of their own desires and their own purposes and have no idea what it truly means to fulfill the purposes of God in the world. And in the end, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for it. As Nate Saint uh, put it, people ask why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they too are expending their lives. And when the bubble has burst, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for the years that they have wasted. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, and I don't think Nate Saint is saying, that you're wasting your life if you're not a missionary. That's not the point here. I know plenty of missionaries who are wasting their lives fulfilling their own desires on the mission field, doing their own thing that has nothing to do with really ultimately fulfilling the purposes of God. So this has nothing to do with being a missionary or not being a missionary. That's not what he's saying here. But how do you know if you are expending your life for vain pursuits? That's where he's going with this. Many people are expending their entire life and in the end they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for it. So the question still remains, how do we know that? How do we know if we will have something of eternal significance? If you expend your life knowing, loving, and serving God, and at the same time, give yourself to know, love, and serve others, then and only then will you be storing up for yourself eternal rewards. Let's continue and see a graphic here of where these hundred uh, live and the majority of them, 75%, the vast majority of the world, the vast majority lives in what's known as the 1040 window. Um, we are the minority and it's not even close. We're this little graphic, the five people here in the bottom right corner, um, that's, that's us. And it's not even close. 75% of the world lives in that area of the 1040 window. Um, what are the religions in the community that, of that hundred that we're looking at? So we broke it down into that. Uh, you have two atheists, 
Um, you have six animus, so that's uh, a mixture of, 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 of different uh, spiritual, spirit, spiritism and different religions like that. Um, you have six Buddhists, you have 13 Hindus, you have 20 Muslims, you have 21 informal religions, which are tribal or, or syncretism. So right here, you have about 70% of the world, right, right here. And then we go and we go, ooh, but we have 32% of Christians. That's what, that's what the statistics tell us. Well, I put professing in quotes because we all know that that's not true. We know that even though some 60% of Americans would state that they are Christians or that they believe in God, we know that that's not true. We just have to look at our world around us and we understand that that's not the case. But 32 of those hundred are professing Christians and the rest, uh, the majority of them have never even heard the name of Christ or never have had the ability to uh, have, the, have the word of God or, or to know who Jesus is. Um, but let's look at those 32 professing Christians because I wanna break this down a little bit even further so that we can kind of understand a little bit more. Who are those 32 Christians? And sorry, I didn't uh, get a chance to change uh, this graphic in, in the side there. It's in Spanish, but you can, you can, you can read along with me. But um, of those 32 Christians in the community, um, 51% of those 32 are Catholic. Okay? Um, so we get rid of half, because just so everybody's clear, I hope we're clear, you cannot believe what the Catholic Church teaches as doctrine and be saved. You can't, at, period. You, can't, it, you may be in the Catholic Church and not believe what they do and get saved and then leave, but you cannot believe and practice what the Catholic ch Church teaches and be a believer of Christ. It's, it's not possible. Um, so we're taking half of those away right away. Uh, of those other, only 26%, or one quarter then, are professing Protestant, uh, 14% are Orthodox, 4% are Anglican, and 4% are other, which are Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, which also say and call themselves Christians, okay? Um, so in reality, out of the 100 in your community, so thir out of those 32, uh, we're going to say one quarter are professing Protestant Christian, uh, which gives us about 8 or so, 8 or 10 of those 32 uh, that would be considered considered professing a biblical evangelical confession of faith. And that just means professing, okay? Um, what I'm trying to point out with this graphic is that the ma vast majority of those professing in our world today are not really true disciples of Christ. The vast majority do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Um, there are some who have speculated, and I, I think with good reason, that only around 10% of those that profess to be Christians uh, are probably true followers of Christ, 10%. And if we look at these statistics by the supposedly professing Christians and, and the, uh, the graphic of, of how that breaks it down, uh, we could probably say that in this community of 100, there's three or four true believers, okay? Um, by your fruit, they will know that you are my disciples, Matthew 7, 16. He that says he knows Christ must Walk as he did, 1 John 2, 6. If you say that you have fellowship with him but walk in darkness, you are a liar and do not practice the truth, 1 John 1, 6. This isn't me saying this, this is Christ saying this. So we just have to look at the fruit and we can see. So the truth is, we live in a world that is in complete and utter darkness. Spiritually lost. The majority of our world does not know Christ. Many profess to know him but they're liars. They're liars. Even the demons believe and shudder. Most of the professing Christians don't even shudder. Right? They don't know the gospel. Um, the most recent George Barna study shows that only 9% of those identifying as Christians possess a biblical worldview. 9%. That goes along with our statistic of about 10% of professing Christians that are true disciples. If you say you're a Christian and you don't have a biblical uh, worldview, it's gonna be really hard for you to live out uh, the scripture and live out the commands of Christ. 66% um, of self-identified Christians believe that if a person does enough good things, they can earn their way to heaven. 66% of professing Christians say that if you do enough good things, you can earn your way to heaven. Is that the gospel? That's not the gospel. The gospel is you can do nothing to earn your way to heaven. 
Christ did everything, and you can do nothing. That's the gospel. Um, 58% of those professing self-identified Christians believe that if a person, sorry, um, sorry, 66%, sorry, 58% of those believe that if a person does a good enough things, they can earn their way to heaven. Um, 66% of self-identifying Christians say that having faith matters more than which faith you pursue. So 66% say, uh, you can believe whatever you want, all roads lead to Rome, right? That's not true. There is one way, and that's through Christ. And then those 58% that say, uh, you can do good things to get to heaven. So those are the most recent statistics that we have. So we could, by that surmise, that the vast majority of the world, including the profession, professing Christian world, is living in abject spiritual poverty. But not only that, the majority of the world uh, is not only living in spiritual poverty, but they're living in physical poverty. So I want to show you this just so we to help us understand a little bit more as well um, about how privileged we are. How many out of your hundred neighbors in this community do you think live in poverty? Out of the hundred, let me ask you another question first. Okay, um, how many of these hundred do you think have access to a toilet? Um, how many toilets do you have? And I put a gold toilet here because, I mean, like, it's like, how many of you have a toilet? I hope everybody in here raises their hand. How many of you have two toilets? How many of you have three toilets? Okay, 60 of your neighbors do not have access to a toilet. 60% of the world's population do not have access to a, to a toilet. I'm going to go a little further. How many of you have toilet paper? Ora, now, ora, now I have gold toilet paper. Because, you know, I remember last year it was like a shortage year and all that, and so it became a serious first world problem. But how many of your neighbors do you think don't even have access to toilet paper? 73 of your 100 neighbors have no access to toilet paper. Okay, so why in the world are you sharing this? I just want you to get a feel for the urgent need that's out there. Um, and not, not, not only the spiritual need, but also the physical need that's out there. Um, so that we can open our eyes a little bit more uh, to think about the extreme blessing that God has poured out on us. And like we sung just, re the blessing that God gave us to proclaim the name of Christ and pro to proclaim Christ uh, in the world that's lost. And so that extreme blessing for us in the American church is a lot of times material blessing as well. Okay, um, and I want us to open our eyes a little bit to that, to that suffering and dying world uh, that's dying without Christ and, and what are we doing with this material, material blessing because I think there is a correlation between where our heart is uh, and where our money is going and not only I think that but Christ says it. Uh, so one more question, how many of you have a car? This is not to make anybody feel bad, feel bad but how many of you have two cars or three cars? Okay, so you don't need to raise your hand on that but out of the 100 in your community, uh, 91 of your neighbors don't have a car, right? And we have two or three, right? So um, you, you are in the top 9% of the world if you have a car, uh, and many of us have more than, have more than one. So uh, I don't really want to extend too much there, but are you rich or poor? And I think we all know the answer to this, but I want to show these statistics anyways. 17 of your neighbors earn less than $1 per day. They earn $6 a week. And I know we're not comparing apples to apples, so I, I mean, we, need to, we need to think about this as well because in some places you can live off of a dollar a week, but you're still in, in poverty uh, in the world's uh, standards. Uh, and you're not living very well, by the way, at a dollar at a, dollar a day. Um, 31 of your neighbors earn less than $2.50 per day. Without any savings, they may make about $15 uh, per week. Um, 32 of your neighbors earn less than $10 per day, uh, about $60 to, per week. Um, there's a statistic that says that somewhere, something like the 80th richest people in the world uh, have more wealth put together than half of the world's poor. So like 80 people have more money uh, between them than, than half of the whole entire world. Uh, but we're looking at here that uh, 32, 31, and 17, uh, we're looking at like something like 99% uh, right there, Right? Only one person earns a hundred dollars a day and seven hundred per week, or thirty-five thousand a year. So, ninety-nine out of your hundred neighbors live in what we would consider uh, pretty uh, impoverished uh, circumstances. They're living. They're living in poverty. Um, only one person out of a hundred earns more than thirty-five thousand in a year. Uh, so, you're that person right there in the middle. I'm assuming. Uh, now, I'm taking that for granted as well. There's probably some students here or some other people that maybe didn't earn 35K. But in general, the American household is, is, is doing better off than that, right? Uh, so we're, we're, this, we're this person here. 
to put it into perspective. And 99 of our neighbors are the rest there that are living on not a whole lot, okay? Um, so if American Christians are in the 1% of the world's wealthiest, where is all of this wealth going? And you're going, well, I, it's got the church is rich, and the church is rich. Uh, the church in America is rich, and we're gonna look at that. Um, what are we doing with all this material blessing? Um, if God has blessed us for the sole purpose to fulfill his purposes in the world, then what are we doing with all of this blessing? On average, American church members give just 2.58% of their income with 25% giving nothing at, at all. So uh, a quarter of you guys, or maybe not you guys, but a quarter of the American church gives zero. Okay? The average... So just think in your mind. Just think in your head, in your mind right now where you're sitting or where you're listening from. Just think, uh, am I below that or above that? Um, am, I, am I below the 2.58? Because um, this is not an unreal number. I, I, I'm thinking, how is this even possible? How does, how does 2.58% equate to knowing, loving, and serving God and knowing, loving, and serving others? And a full one quarter of the American church gives zero. How is that possible? Even with these abysmal numbers, the church in America, for the most part, is wealthy. But how is that wealth being used to fulfill God's purposes? We're going to go a little bit further. American Christians spend, in the American church, the, or, or the American church spends 95% on home-based ministry. Okay. Um, 4.5% on cross-cultural efforts in already reached people groups and 0.5% to reach the unreached. Okay, of that 95% on home-based ministry, um, 50% of that is to pay salaries of pastors. 22% is to pay for the upkeep and expansion of buildings and 13% for the church expenses such, such as electricity and supplies. Um, that's 85%. 85% of the offerings that are coming into the average church in America are staying in the church in America. So what are we doing? We're building our little empires, right? Because then we go, oh, well, there's still 15%. Yeah, well, 10% of that is local outreach. So let's try to fill your empire, which there's nothing wrong because our empire, our, our world is right here in this moment, right? Our, our, our evangelistic outreach efforts are happening here, but it's not just to get people here, right? That's, that shouldn't just be the goal that we have. Um, and then we see a whopping 5% to missions. Um, and that's 4.5% in cross-cultural efforts that are already reached people groups and 0.5 to the unreached. Um, of foreign missions funding, of that 5%, over that leftover that's 5% that's going to missions, 87% goes for work among those already Christian. 87% goes to fund ministries that are already working with already people that are already reached, that are already Christian. Okay, 12.5% for the work among already evangelized. So these are already people who have the gospel and they're already evangelized, um, but they're looking to uh, re-evangelize them. There's this huge push right now to be in Europe and to all these other places right now. They're, these people are, are already evangelized nations. Now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just telling you where it's all going. I, I'm actually working in a place that we would consider is an evangelized place because the gospel is there, the word of God is there, but 95% of the people where, where we work are, are, are Catholic, and, and so we can't say that they're, they're a reached people in that sense because less than 1% are, are actually uh, uh, evangelical Christian. Um, but then you have 0.5% for work among the unreached people. Um, Christians spend... Uh, more money uh, to work with the already Christian and it's not even close, right? And to, and to evangelize the already reached and it's not even, 0.5% we're looking at, right? To reach the unreached people groups. Um, the average American Christian, so the average is 2.58% uh, with 25% giving nothing. So the average American Christian gives one penny a day to foreign missions. That's the average of the professing Christians uh, in, in America to global missions, uh, one penny a day. Um, and 99.5% of that money goes to support the work among those already Christian or already evangelized. Um, look, there's no question that we're not stewarding the resources that God has entrusted to us in a way that's Christ exalting. So that's why I'm presenting um, this to you. Uh, if, the, if the American church spends the 
the vast majority of its offerings, um, 95% to, to ma maintain the pastors and the buildings uh, and, and maintain uh, this ministry here, then what are we really accomplishing? Uh, the majority of American churches are not growing. They're actually dying. And so if you have a growing church, that's a phenomena here. And so what are we pouring our money into? 95% of that money that's coming in is going to an organization that's dying. Right? And what are we doing? We're just living the fat and happy American church experience. Okay, and this isn't just happening in America, it's happening in other places as well, so I don't wanna feel like I'm just browbeating uh, you here, but um, I wanna encourage you as an individual and as a congregation as a whole to evaluate where you are on this spectrum. Um, evaluate your individual budget, evaluate your individual giving, evaluate your church's budget. Um, does it look like this graphic? Does 95% of what comes in uh, stay in the church or, or are, you, are you more balanced? That's a, that's a, a question that we have to ask. Um, are you, as an individual, are you consuming 97.5% of what God has given you to steward on your own desires and on yourself? On as individuals, we spend and spend and spend on things that we don't need and we think that that's gonna satisfy us and it never does. And the whole time we're missing God's purposes for us. We're missing that blessing that God has for us and we're forfeiting that incredible blessing that God has for us. All the while thinking that we're uh, going to fulfill something. And one day we're all gonna stand before God and we're gonna give an account for every penny that has gone through our fingertips. And I know the majority of us haven't had a penny in our fingertips in a long time. Uh, but in Mexico, we still use cash. And so we have a lot of it going through as cash. And so you kind of get attached to it a little bit more. And you go, okay, what am I using this for? But when you have the card, it's just like, eh. And now you don't have the card, you just play your phone and you scan it. And it's like, how much did we spend on? Yeah, at the end of the month. So, but you're going to give an account. You will. Every one of us will give an account. Um, we just re recently evaluated our last year at the church in Zacatecas Bible Church. Uh, and, and since planting the church, we've always made reaching the lost a priority because when you start with uh, three families in a house, your whole priority is reaching the lost, right? Because um, uh, that's what you're trying to do. Uh, but this last year, even in the pandemic and, and when everything was going uh, really poorly for many people, uh, we were able to give over 30% of what came into the church uh, specifically to missions, specifically to reaching the, the lost and dying. 20% of that was to unreached people that were pouring into uh, in, in the mountains of Chihuahua and into other unreached people groups uh, and we're preparing uh, men right now. We have, have a man uh, that are, we're going to be uh, sending out uh, of our church in October that's going to Turkey, he's going to Iraq, and he's going to Jordan, and we're praying that the Lord will allow him to stay there, get his visas so he can learn the language and plant, plant churches there. Um, and that's coming from within the body of Christ, understanding that there's a whole lot of unreached people groups out there that have not heard the gospel and need to know about Christ. And so our focus has been uh, on that. And I'm not saying that to brag or to claim that like we know what's going on or, or we're doing enough because we're just one little tiny uh, church that really has not a whole lot of an income, you know, being in a Hispanic community. But the reality is, is uh, we're giving the people a passion to understand that there's a whole world outside besides what they're living in. Um, I don't want you to think that what I'm saying with this that God is against us owning stuff. Um, I don't remember who said this, but um, God's not against us owning stuff. God's against uh, our stuff owning us. And so it, we can have stuff, but let's use it for God's kingdom, right? We can have um, nice things. And, and it's not a, uh, he's not against us being in that 1% of the wealthy, but how are we administering what God has entrusted to us in light of the great commandment? Uh, and Jesus actually had something to, to say, and he rebuked um, the... The, in the parable of the rich uh, fool in Luke 12, 15, don't need to go there, but um, he was accumulating for himself. He's accumulating, accumulating stuff um, for his desires, his wants, and Christ looked at him and he said, you're a fool. You're a fool. And demanded his life that very night, right? Um, and all that he had toiled for was left to rot. Um, God has blessed us so that we can in turn be a blessing. Um, and those who do give, in the church at large, we do have a responsibility to know where, where our giving is going um, and the purpose for which uh, it's going. So when we see that graphic and it says 95% of everything stays here, like we as, as a body of Christ, we should know what our church is doing um, and, and how we are reaching out as, as a church body, not only individually, but also as a church body. Um, 
and whether or not our giving is fulfilling the purposes of God. And as just as a side right here, I just want to mention this one thing. Only one quarter of North American cross-cultural missionaries are involved in evangelism activities, such as evangelism, preaching, translation, church planting, and teaching, while three quarters are involved in administration and support work, such as agricultural, aviation, community development, literacy, medicine, and relief efforts. Now look, I'm not here to talk about um, whether uh, or not aviation, agriculture, and all these other things uh, are needed. They're needed, right? They are needed. These support works are needed. That's not what I'm, I'm here to say. But do we know where our support dollars are going? Are they going to planting biblical churches? Are they going to evangelistic efforts in the unreached? Or are we going to just uh, giving our money uh, to help support somebody who's supporting somebody who's supporting somebody who's supporting somebody? Like, we need to really think about this. Do we even have a worldview that would even allow us to pinpoint what is um, biblical missions, to define what is biblical missions? If I were to ask you, could you define what biblical missions was, what would you say? I personally would not say that it looks like a quarter of the people that are sent out are evangelizing and church planning and three quarters are doing other stuff, okay? Um, Paul Washer says, biblical missions consist of a biblical church training up biblically qualified elders and sending them out to plant biblical churches. There's a lot of biblicals in there. But like, this is the manual, right? And I think he has the Bible on his side when he's proclaiming that statement. We've lost our focus on what biblical missions really is. And I understand um, that there's that need uh, for those support workers, but three quarters to, to, to a quarter? For every one church planter, every one person that's out there evangelizing, there's three quarters of the people that are just out there to support that one person? I don't know that that can be brought from Scripture. Um, we just have this problem in the church that whoever comes along asking for support, well, it's Paul's brother's cousin, uh, friend, who's a really great guy, um, and he's going to help so-and-so administer the books. Is there somebody that needs to administer the books? I'm sure there is, somewhere. But that doesn't mean that we have to every single time start pouring our money into those people and start giving to those ministries because we need to have a, a vision that says our primary objective is to know and love and serve others and that's through taking the gospel to them, right? Um, let's, let's take this back, uh, connect this back to our text from today because I believe this is directly related to our knowing, loving, and serving God and our knowing, loving, and serving people um, because what we're saying with our mouth is yes, we believe the book, right? Yes, we believe it. But then we show by our sacrifice of our 2.5%. And then of that 2.5%, really, there's not a whole lot of it that's going to actually fulfilling the purposes uh, of this book. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the great first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, I so appreciate Pastor Chago's message from a couple weeks ago where he challenged us to pursue others and to pursue relationships. Um, the truth is there are way too many church attenders that are just attending and never do anything. They're just church building Christians. Um, and now since the pandemic, now they're not even church building Christians, right? I understand there's a need for some people to stay home. I, I get it. Um, but we're a year and a half later as well. Um, and if that defines your Christian life, then I don't know that you're following this book. And this passage, love your neighbor, has been hijacked this last year and a half yeah. to mean stay home and shut yourself in your house. That is not the gospel message, okay? Um, and then there's those who just say, man, I just love Jesus. I just love Jesus with all my heart. I just don't love the people. Man, I just love God. I love God so much, I just can't stand the church. Man, just in case you're wondering, that whole idea is anti-gospel. It's anti-scripture, and it's flat-out anti-God. That does not come from this book. That person doesn't love God at all. He loves himself. Um, if you have no desire to grow in your knowledge, love, and service of the Lord, and at the same time grow in your knowledge, love, and service for your neighbor, then you are not saved. If you don't have those two things together, you are not a true disciple of Jesus. You may be just growing in that. You may be just starting in that. You may be just getting there. But if you don't have that desire and have those things working together, then you don't know Christ. You don't know the Jesus of the scriptures. There is no biblical category for you as a believer if that describes you. 
If you don't love God enough to get to know him, to follow him, to obey him, to serve him, and at the same time have a desire to get to know others and to love others and to serve others, then you are a, an unbeliever, at least practicing your unbeliever. This is the essence of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And if you aren't living this, then you aren't a true follower of Christ. It doesn't matter how many Sundays you attend church or how many sermons you download during the week. We exist to love God. Do you love God? 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. One of the ways we can know if we love God is if we have love for one another. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for, his, for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. We've got the world's goods, brothers and sisters. God has richly blessed us with one purpose, and that's so that we can be a blessing. And I'm not advocating for the social gospel. That's not what this is about. Um, this specific text is referencing helping fellow believers. But God has seriously blessed us, and we're average, on average giving 2.5% back, if, as if we could give something back to God when 100% of it's his. Um, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. American Christians spend more on dog food on a monthly basis than they do on the mission of God. We spend more money saving our animals and vet bills and they don't have a soul than we do on saving and reaching the lost. Am I saying you can't have a pet? No, I'm not. Just look at the comparison, though. Just have a balance. Some of us can afford to have a pet, and some of us can't. And if you spend more on your dog than you do on world missions, then you're missing the point. And we can't just keep talking about it or singing about it. We have to actually do it and live it out. 1 John 4, 7, 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Loving God is loving people. You cannot have one without the other. This isn't about church attendance. We exist to know, love, and serve God, and to know, love, and serve others. I mentioned earlier um, that this one sentence for the past 12 to 15 years has dictated my whole, whole life since then. Since that point in my life, it's dictated everything that we do. This one declaration dictates my whole family's life, and I'm not sharing this I, to, to, to brag or, 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 or anything. I want to lift up Christ and magnify Christ, but it's only, the only example that I can, I can give you right now. Um, we we rec recently built a house in Zacatecas. We sold our house in Oregon uh, quite a few years back, and we built a house in Zacatecas. And from the moment we started looking for a place to build, for a property to buy, um, for the location, and planning how to invest, and in, from the floor plan, and from choosing uh, everything deep down to the details, and every decision we made, we put it through this lens. So when we went and picked out a piece of property in the middle of downtown, which is one of the sketchiest, uh, most difficult places that's uh, really dangerous right now to live, and purchase a piece of property, the people looked at us and go, what are you doing? Everybody here that has money is buying in a gated community. What are you thinking? It's dangerous. And I said, I don't care. I have to put it through this lens. If my lens is to get to know and love and serve people, I cannot move my family in Mexico into a gated community with a bunch of rich people who don't want to know their neighbor. So we purchased that land in the middle of, in, in, middle of downtown. Um, we designed the floor plan uh, of the house to accommodate as many people as possible. A few weeks, a couple months back, we had 125 people for a wedding at our house. On a monthly basis, we hold small group and prayer nights in our home where anywhere from 40 to 60 people come. Um, every two weeks, we have all the youth there, uh, 20 to 30 youth uh, in our home. All week long, three to four nights a week, we have uh, personal discipleships in our home. Um, earlier in the year, we purchased an espresso machine, and it was an expensive espresso machine, and I don't even drink coffee, and I was hesitant to buy it because I'm like, I don't even drink coffee, but we bought this really nice machine because I looked at it through the lens of this, and I said, like, I can invite people to my house, and, and they can't get a coffee here like this. They're not going to go buy this coffee. I mean, we do have a Starbucks, but these people that we're working with are not going to Starbucks. 
like in the last six months, we've served 500 coffees. Like we have a line item in our budget that's just for coffee. And I don't drink coffee. We built a pizza oven. I love pizza. But we built a pizza oven on our patio. Um, normally, you would make a pizza in a pizza oven. Like we make 30. We had a, a, a day where we had 100. We made 100 pizzas. We spent eight hours making pizza. Is that because I love pizza so much? No, it's because I love people. And I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just saying that God did something in my life and in our life, and it changed that perspective. And you could say, oh, but it's because you're a, a missionary. Um, it might be, but I don't think so. We were doing this stuff before we ever went to Mexico. Not to that scale. Like, we had a smaller house, so we could have, you know, a couple families over, and we could serve a couple coffees, and we could make a couple pizzas. But now God's blessed us because our whole desire has been to serve him and to make much of him known wherever we are and that's not to brag on us it's to brag on christ and so wherever you are what could god do among you what could god do here what would it look like as a church body if each family, each person individually, let this mission statement dictate your whole existence. What could God do among you? What could God do to fulfill his purposes for you personally and in the world through your church? But Josh, that's like for radical Christians, right? Like it's like for radical Christ followers. That's for Jesus freaks. I don't even like the word radical. I don't even like to use the term radical. Um, Honestly, I dislike it because I think it, I I believe personally that just defines what a a believer is, what a Christ follower is. Um, I don't think there's anything radical about it. I think it's just the definition of following Christ. And and you guys just finished the book of Acts recently. Uh, You saw it, right? You saw it in the book of Acts. You saw it in the lives of the apostles. You saw it in the lives of the disciples of the early church all throughout the book of Acts. I don't think it was intended to demonstrate a radical following of Christ, As if there were like two categories, like those who are really on the next level and then like just the normal Christians. Like the book of Acts, I understand um, that there's some amazing things taking place there and and it's descriptive rather than prescriptive in, in most cases, but I think we're actually seeing what it really truly means to live a life that is with the purpose to know, love, and serve God and know, love, and serve others. Um, And I want to connect this to the Great Commission. So we have the Great Commandment here. I want to connect to the Great great Commission and and, and end here. Um, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. If I wasn't a good missionary, I wouldn't present this verse. Um, If I wasn't doing my job. I remember I was sitting there sometimes and the missionaries would come and be like, really, you're going to share that verse again? Like, come on. But you have to, right? Because you have the Great Commandment and you have the Great Commission. There's like two things that the Christian should be doing. There's two things that describe what a Christian life is. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we have the Great Commission, and we have the Great Commandment, and both are given us to teach us how to fulfill God's purposes for us in the world. So our love for God, our love for people, turns us into, what's it turn us into? It turns us into on fire, spirit-filled Christians on mission to spend every ounce of energy, to risk everything, everything we are, everything we have, to exhaust every resource at our disposal for one purpose, to fulfill this task of reproducing other on-fire, spirit-filled Christians on mission. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of this life, by bringing glory to God through fulfilling his mission. Um, Matt Chandler Chandler recently said um, if you're a bored Christian or if you're bored as a Christian um, if you're kind of just like yeah uh, I like God then you're doing it wrong if you're just kind of like eh Sunday again and that's your existence you're you're wrong you're doing it wrong Um, don't hear me wrong this is not a works based salvation uh, what he's, he's referring to here and what I'm referring to is completely a, a grace of God thing. It says nothing to do with you and everything to do with Christ. Um, as Titus 3.5 tells us that we're not saved by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Um, but you're now in the grace of God and you are kind of just coasting along and, and it's getting kind of old. Um, then I want to ask you, like when's the last time you actually discipled somebody? 
When's the last time you personally made a disciple? When's the last time you saw someone that you discipled get baptized? When's the last time you spent weeks, months, or years pouring into that person and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus Christ has commanded? Not in your own strength, but in the power of Christ who is in you always. If that doesn't describe your Christian life, if that's not your identity, if that's not in your DNA, then as Matt challenged you, you're either doing it wrong or you're not a follower of Christ. Because like this is the gist of the whole Christian life. It's loving God and loving others and making disciples. Um, statistics show that within three to five years, the church takes a new on fire believer who desires to share the gospel and who is sold out for Christ and in the power of the Spirit. And it only takes the church less than five years to turn them into nothing more than just a church attender. Uh, what that means is that they come to Christ and they come in here and they're all excited and jazzed and they go and share with everybody and they want to do what God calls them to do. And they look around and see that nobody else is doing that and that. It's just a Sunday thing, and then they're like, okay, this must be what it is to, to be a Christ follower. And within five years, that's what they turn into. Um, make disciples. Can you name the last disciple you made? Like, this is a legit question. Husbands, uh, talk to the men. Your wife should be on that list. Your children should be on that list. If they're not, you're not fulfilling your purpose in your family, and you cannot fulfill your purpose in the world. Um, they're your closest neighbors, right? Start with them. Um, can you name one or two people that you're intentionally pouring into right now with that purpose? Look, I'm not a people person, you could say. Yeah, try that one on God. Remember Moses? <laughs> he kind of laughed at him and said, ha ha. Look, loving God and loving people and making disciples is not boring. It's tiring, it's exhausting, it's difficult, it's painful, it's maddening, it's sad, it's joyful, it's exciting, it's fulfilling, it's miraculous, but it's not boring. Being a church attender is boring, honestly. If this was what it was about, I wouldn't follow Christ. I'm not saying this isn't important, it's important, and this is good. We're worshiping God. That's one aspect. But if it weren't for this, for giving my whole entire life to this, like, it would be really boring. And I don't know why I'd be doing it. And if that's you, if that's how you feel coming here on Sunday or during the week, then repent. Please repent. And turn to Christ and trust him to give you the strength and to give you the purpose and begin to fulfill that purpose for your life in your personal life and in the life of the church. Like, that's the great mission of the church. It's to exalt the name of Christ. That's why we're here. I'm so thankful for Chago. I'm so thankful for the church. I'm so thankful for you inviting me to be here to share with you. I'm so thankful that you guys have a focus on missions in your church. That's not even normal in the churches today. So the fact that you guys are doing that, that's great. And I just pray that the Lord would bless you for that. And I pray that the Lord would bless his word in your life as you continue to meditate on this call. Love God, serve God, love people, serve people, make disciples. That's why we're here. It's the only reason we're here. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this call upon our lives. We thank you because we can know you intimately. We can come to love you through your word and we can serve you obeying the principles that are found in scripture. Through that, we can extend that grace to others as we get to know others and as we get to love on others and as we get to serve others and we just see your kingdom grow through our life. Our life is nothing without you and we can't do any of this without the power of your spirit. So continue to control us by your spirit, Lord, and help us to fulfill your purposes for the world each and every day of our lives, each and every moment that we all would be people who would live 
according to this mission to know, love, and serve God and to know, love, and serve others. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heaven.